Um, such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, yeah, you hear that a lot, I'm sure. But um, I was at the show on Wednesday night uh, in Cape Town. Um, and I saw you perform. And I was trying to remember when you were last in Cape Town because you played at Greenpoint Park. It must have been 2018, I think. Yeah, um, that sounds about right. Yeah. 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 And that show, um, I mean, I've, you know, I've been very fortunate to, to watch a lot of uh, live acts over the last 30 years because I'm decidedly old. Um, so I've, I've, I've seen a lot. Um, and, you know, what you do, you go through this thing where, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it, where you kind of rank shows. Um, and yeah, I've seen some of the great, the legendary acts. But that show that I saw back in 2018, um, was fundamental for me. It really did change um, my view on on certainly on, on on what was happening at the time. So it, it it now comfortably racks in my top ten. I'm not saying where exactly, but Wednesday night show was equally uh, memorable. Different setting, different vibe, but yet you captured it so so beautifully. And the thing that kind of struck me was the fact that each of the songs that you've written over the last seventeen years, they incredibly succinct in the sense that they are perfect two and a half probably uh, on average they could they probably you know, come out at about less than three minutes long right yeah a lot of them do um there there are there are rare cases where it exceeds like four minutes yeah um, yeah yeah um, yeah there's that old saying if i had more time i would have written you a shorter letter and um <laughs> i think I think there's something really appealing to me about squeezing a lot of density into something like that and seeing, seeing if you can make something feel uh, you know like there's a there's did I break up for you or can you hear me okay um you did for a second but keep going yeah just the idea of um saying a lot with a little and, and squeezing all that in was always like interesting to just uh, actual um it wasn't it wasn't uh necessarily in an effort to have it fit in some box because it's funny like some of the songs that fans like a lot are longer you know like big parade is longer and sleep on the floor is a little bit longer and um for us longer and uh <laughs> and so it's it's like it's like a, a fascination with the economy of all that, just trying to make it all dense. And I had a friend, uh, a, now a friend, but a teacher of mine that he said, you know, try to say the most with the least, whether it's on your instrument or your lyrics, like, and that, that became a mantra that I on a cellular and it, it would not work. This is like reminding me of the days of the thick of COVID, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess, I guess if I can roll with it, if we break up, I'll just try to be patient. And we can no, no, go for it. I think, I think this is going to work. Okay, cool. Cool. So, yeah, we, we obviously spoke about the um, less is more. Uh, I think I could learn from, from you because I tend to waffle. Um, but I think, yeah, I think you as, you, as you summed up, you capture it uh, so beautifully. And all of the power and all of that intensity is within each of those tracks. And I think it, it definitely, um, you feel it in a live space with the pacing you know of, of how you keep that energy going and it's uh yeah uh, quite extraordinary um so thank you for that <laughs> um yeah but, you, <clears throat> you know you touched on it on wednesday and you know i think to to some fans they don't see you know the lumineers as being a you know a band that's been around for as long as you have um and in many cases you know it's been 17 years you've released four albums yes eps and bits and bobs in between but it, it really took seven years for the band to kind of for the world to go ah okay um you know that you were kind of worthy or relevant at the time and besides obviously the dj i think it was in seattle who 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 picked up on the song was it as simple as that was the catalyst that fundamentally triggered the the landslide that then followed or the snowball that then became whatever 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a lot of friends who are artists and we'll have conversations about, uh, what is it, what was the domino that fell? What was the silver bullet? And I think the answer is probably like a thousand tiny dominoes had to fall the right way. Um, you know, there's a great book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I know it well. You've read it? Yeah, yeah. and I, I thought it really painted an accurate picture of when something like what happened to us happens. It's not based on talent alone or songwriting or something like that. It's it's this odd confluence of events. Um, so for us, we had been anonymous so long that we got to experiment and without any criticism and just try out all these different things and see what we were truly passionate about. And I think that's a problem with some artists is that they hit early and they're not even quite sure yeah. who they are or what they're interested in. And then they get this feedback loop that this one thing is cool to your audience. And then they, it's like the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. So I think with yeah. us, there was this idea of uh, you, we were, we had been preparing for something to break for, for a number of years. And then when we got our break, we were sort of more seasoned in the way of performing a little more and having written a lot of songs together and just holding our ground when it came to having real autonomy with how we wanted to release albums and um, the songs that would make those records. So I, for example, I remember um, by the time we got a record deal, I was 30 and mm. the record deal we took was it gave us all the autonomy we could ask for. You know, we get to, it's a one record deal and we've done that ever since where, you know, you just kind of, you do record to record and, and you're not stuck with somebody who's not passionate about what you're doing. Uh, so having that attention and then, yeah, just a huge part of it is sort of protecting this candle that is your, it's like the, the wind is blowing and you're on this cliffside and it's raining. And then yeah. that, that candle is like your art. Like if you can uh, protect that, that means a lot to us because um, otherwise you're just kind of like writing for other people. So you're, you're trying to do it on your own terms. And for us that we've been really lucky to do that. And I think part of that was just that success came pretty late. If at all, it came late and, and it, it worked to our advantage. So we were able to, uh, I remember for songs and there was, uh, yeah. I remember they said they would play, they played Oh Hey on top 40 radio in America, which is, I guess, it's a really big deal, but it's a strange world. Yeah. And then they were like, okay, we were going to play Stubborn Love, but you have to cut it. You have to cut these parts of it out. And we said, no. Mm. And then they didn't play it. And we were like, that's fine. And we were like, that's fine though. Like it, it was kind of like, if you can't, if you're going to make us uh, adapt too much to you, I'm not interested in that. And that if I was 20 versus 30, I'd probably would have said, chop it up, yeah. get us yeah. on there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I think that just that's a, and and all along the way, you know, the past album three before this fourth one, yeah. um, we were able to make these music videos and put uh, a lot of energy and resources into those, making a whole album into a music video. And we were inspired by Beyonce's Lemonade and Florence and the Machines series, mm -hmm. and it really offered us a way to illustrate what we were singing about. Because I think in the way we present the songs, I think some of the a little kid can understand the rhythm of it and everything, but maybe the meaning behind it might wash over some listeners. So it was yeah. really a joy to expose like what we're really seeing about, even if it's dark and even if it's on the sad side or dramatic, it's like, it's cool to say, Hey, just so you know, this is what we're singing about because uh, as I mentioned, probably at the show you were at, mm -hmm. cause it's a funny story to tell. It's like, everybody dances to ho hey at their weddings if they pick one of our songs. And it was about a breakup. Yeah. And I heard the same I heard the same story from Bono about their song One, yeah. where he's like, why are, why are people getting married to or dancing to this song at their wedding? This is a, a terrible breakup. Um, so, Nobody reads the lyrics, you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, think, I think part of it is just um, being very fortunate that things ever happened. But then when they did happen, maybe being a little more ready for a moment than if it all happened in the beginning. Um, yeah. Yeah. music's unique that way. I think actors have to usually start early and athletes obviously start early. And with music, I feel like you have this, I mean, look at Rodriguez, you have these, you have these examples of people that hit late and yeah. then they really impact the people because they're a little more formed than yeah. what happens yeah. when you, when you hit early.
Yeah, and I think it's also about, as you said earlier, it's a, it's a case of joining the dots and it, whether it's, you know, it's a combination of serendipity and it's a combination of, yes, the universe colluding in your favor. But, you know, as a creative, as you join those dots and you understand what those dots can do, I think you do weirdly and unconsciously engineer, <clears throat> you know, and adapt your path to, to the point that you, you did. But, um, Obviously, the core of the band is you and Jeremiah. That's obviously, that's well known. But the thing, again, that struck me um, at the show on Wednesday is that, you know, you've got this incredibly powerful um, sub, um, touring band with you, which um, in my mind, I'm going, okay, you strip them away. Jeremiah and you go in studio. You know, surely that must be pretty hard because obviously you know part of your success is the fact that you're one of the biggest touring bands in the world and so all of that energy um i mean it, it's, it's palpable um you know you, at the show you you literally feeding off of one another and there's just so much personality coming off that stage and i always just thought that's probably the reason why you've only done four albums over the last 17 years because it's really hard when the two of you are sitting there going okay let's put an album together <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, we put other music out to be clear, but as the Lumineers, we started using that in 2009. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, we had all these rough drafts that sometimes we yeah. steal from ourselves when someone's never heard something by our old band named Wesley Jeremiah or something. Uh, yeah. There you go, back in the room. <laughs> this is like an interview in, ch in chapters. I'm really sorry. It just it's like, okay. got me. What is there? No, no, it's um, all good. Keep going. So where yeah. did you uh what was the last question you had asked because uh i kind of was trying to get on wi-fi and lost track sorry about that yeah now I'll, I'll keep yeah. it short right <laughs> so yeah basically <laughs> just the energy obviously that you enjoy on you know on oh, yeah. with a band yeah um, going into studio how do you how do you bottle that to, and then and bring that energy in when you do record yeah i mean we're really lucky to have the people we tour with i feel like everybody is pushing the show forward in a genuine way and I, I i look at it like jer and i are the if it was a movie we're writing the script and then we need everybody to put it on the play we need to yeah. we need but like they do it with a lot of ownership and i think that was why it comes off the way it does because they yeah. really there were a real band up there and and, yeah. and sometimes it's just I, I think we really like the idea of uh having a a you know, vision and like not doing decisions by committee, but someone yeah. really being passionate about this idea. And then we follow them, you know, and uh, it's, it's one person usually. Um, but anyway, I think we try to basically write songs that we feel are like distinct over something that would play well live because there's a lot of quiet moments in our set. And if you're really trying to create I don't know that excitement. It wouldn't wouldn't be that. So yeah, I feel like again, just trying to put things in the right order. Um, that energy, I think, comes from this feedback loop where you're playing a song that someone spent a lot of time with in their car and their on their headphones, walking around or in their bedroom or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're playing that, and that creates this energy. And then we're excited, and it's this whole exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I think the mistake you can make is that. I've heard this happen to a lot of bands and we were lucky enough to open for you too, but that bands open for them and then they want to be that thing. Yeah. And that's literally not who you are. So, cannot do it. and we were, we opened for them on their Joshua tree tour, uh, yeah. like, like uh, the anniversary, the 30th anniversary. And I mean, just watching them put that on, it, you don't even feel jealous. You just feel in awe of yeah. like, that there's something that has been 30 years old and it still makes people cry and has new people coming to the table. And so I think um, trying to uh, be in touch with what we're into and what we like um, has helped, I think, the live show. But it's very unorthodox. I think a lot of people don't really know what to make of us. And then they mm -hmm. come out and they're like, oh, it's that thing? Yeah. Wow, okay. And so... Uh, I still think to this day we sneak up on people in a good way. I like you do. That. You We're do. Sort of this weird yeah. underdog. Yeah, you did that. You did that to me in 2018. I mean, I was a fan of the of of your music, but the the inclination or even just the the curiosity around wanting to see you live 
wasn't necessarily there, but that was the thing that absolutely blew me away in 2018 to the point that, you know, I wanted to see you perform now. But on the, on the basis that you you had this, this incredibly rare privilege to tour with, you know, a band the caliber of, of you two, you step on stage on Wednesday and you perform a Cure cover, <laughs> not, a, not a U2 cover. But I have to say that what you did with Just Like Heaven, if I was Robert Smith, I'd be highly pissed off right about now because I just think you, you, you re, rewrote that song or re, re-represented it in a way that, yeah, it, it left goosebumps running. And um, the, the point, or rather the question is, taking a song like that, again, with you know, 30, 40 years of legacy in this band, why take a Cure song and do what you did to it? You know, of all the bands in all the world, well, it was just an interesting cover. I think we used to do a lot of covers in bars and I get really frustrated when I would hear artists do what I'd call like the wedding band present. Yeah. Everything is the same. Maybe yeah. the singer's voice is laid upon what yeah. already sounds like the track. So in that case, all credit goes to Jer where he, he showed me this thing and he showed it to me on a piano that was kind of wonky and out of tune. It was my piano in my basement. And, and we recorded it that day. So I, I wasn't even super familiar with the lyrics as far as like singing it in that moment. So mm. that also helps. Like I know the song well, but I don't know all these nuances that he does. So I'm now doing things that I would naturally do. And I think, again, like doing the unexpected, it's why you like characters in movies as you know, that surprise you, the villain petting the cat. And, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, <laughs> Uh, a lot of examples out there but i would describe like post Malone as such an unexpected artist mm-hmm. where he does all these things that you have to believe because why else would he do exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? exactly i think uh i feel like with the cure cover it felt like something that you're a wire not supposed to touch and then it was like well what if we did it this way because it's just like in the pa- pantheon for me of these ha- that's just a crazy song like how do you even mess with it and then we found this sort of side of it that we really like and and we decided to play it um but it is one of those things it's nothing more in some ways than like i would listen to this if i hadn't yeah recorded it like i like this version as well and i think it i would be bored if someone covered one of our songs and it sounded just like ours it would exactly just be like and that is the down. point right yeah i mean i yeah. remember a lawyer sitting in an office somewhere in LA a hundred years ago, where he he basically turned around and said to me, you could call your band you too, if you like, but then you've got to be as good, if not better than them. In the same way that <laughs> what you would, what you've done is that you've respectfully taken a song and you've, as you say, you've interpreted it, you've made it your own. Um, and I think if, if Robert Smith sent you a note to go, you know, kudos uh, and thanks very much for introducing our music probably to a whole new audience certainly uh, you know americana audiences wouldn't be um, i think necessarily familiar with the cure but um yeah I, i'm just jumping back to touring um you know like we said you've you've recorded a number of works but over the 17 years you certainly haven't been prolific from a studio perspective but you have been from a live perspective it's a lot of work to, to perform live would you say that part of your your success and the, your longevity is the fact that you do actually enjoy going out on the road and that you do spend time in front of your audiences. Yeah, I mean, um, it's very funny because I feel like sometimes the most unlikely people find the path in a way that, yeah, it just was unexpected. I, I'm a writer at heart and so is Jer and pretty introverted. Um, and not like an overly bubbly, like zany person. Like I, I'm serious when I get locked in on something, I think I doggedly pursue it and there's that passionate side of me. But I, even in trying to set up some of these songs, with, hey, during a live show, hey, I used to be patently against ex- talking to the audience at all. I was like, the really? music should speak for itself. And I got an argument with a total stranger one time about how I think that's so wrong. <laughs> and my, my wife was like, 
what is, why are you so mad at that? And I think I was actually mad at the idea that I had to do more up there than I would felt prepared to do. And it was like being vulnerable and really, but also it was cool because we wrote, I'm, I'm primarily the lyricist and writing stories and telling stories and basing them in life experiences or people I meet. It's just very, it's it's cool to expose that because I've had that happen with other songs where I go, do you know what this is about? And not to do it with every song, but to pick some spots where you do that, I think was helpful. But we, in the beginning, I couldn't eat for like over 24 hours solid foods like before a show because it was so much stage fright and so much yeah. anxiety. So I would like make shakes and just like drink them or something. Yeah. Like I would blend stuff. It wouldn't matter yeah. what like. <laughs> what um, chicken and, and beef. <laughs> yeah, just like it was just trying to get calories in because I, I couldn't bear the thought of um, going on stage. And then over time, it seemed to get better because I felt prepared and I started to really in, more enjoy it. Mm. Um, so I think part of it was, I say this to people, not to be self-serving, but to like, I hope if someone hears this and there's somebody that thinks they can't, they're not meant to do something. For me, there was a lot of indicators that said you probably shouldn't perform shouldn't be doing this you know like you feel nauseous before you go on stage and <laughs> uh and everything um but over time it's almost like all that gave way to something new and I found like the thing that I wasn't good at became a strength where if I did go there and you got me to go there I could pull from my heart mm. and perform from a different place than those people who can just you're on now. And they go, mm. like, I, mm. I, I'm not a flick of a switch guy. It's like, I'll spend an hour getting ready emotionally almost, or getting yeah. in that spirit of trying to go on stage. And I think because of that, I like that, that that's different about me. But in the beginning, I hated it because yeah. other people could be hanging out, doing whatever, and then go on stage. And I had and to- And is that still the case? Are you, are you, do, you, do you do that to this day? I mean- I'd say it's it's more like now an hour before the show. It used to be like kind of half the day or all day. And now okay. it's, I can I can compartmentalize and I think have a, a healthier life because of it. But <laughs> but I think uh, like my kids will see me, you know? Um, but mm. I think um, I admire those that can simply go on stage and do that. It's not a knock, but I would say one of the beautiful things about getting over a hump like that is that you realize, oh, well, this other thing you thought was bad and annoying about your personality or your tendencies, you can, you can lean into that. And that could be yeah. something that makes you, you, instead yeah. of it being like, man, I wish I was just like so-and-so. And it's like, well, so-and-so is not like you. And you'll, your audience tends to find exactly. you when you are presenting you, I think, versus presenting what you think they want. I think there's like a feeling among people, uh, when you witness, like, I saw Neil Young when I was really young, you know, like in high school, sophomore, yeah. probably 13, 14, and um, he was solo, and I saw him at this theater, and there was, I had never seen somebody perform like that or talk to an audience like that, uh, and then after that, I remember seeing Dave Matthews, and I'd never, and it was him and Tim Reynolds, and never seeing someone talk to an audience like that, yeah. and they were yeah. so different, but they got through to me in a similar way of like, it just felt like they were being authentic. And that's way easier said than done, I think, because it's a vulnerable thing. But those were pretty good examples for me early on of like, it's not one way to do it. Hmm. It's just, it's just, you kind of have to play around and experiment to figure out who you are up there. Because I was really kind of, um, I think I would freeze or I would just focus on the music and I forgot like you're also giving yourself. So it, it did help. Yeah. Um, yeah, because too. well, clear, clearly you're a masochist because it it it, <laughs> se it seems you know that it's this it's a push pull thing is that you want to do it you you love it but the but the the process and then the irony of that is that you do it a lot you know you guys are yeah. touring a lot all over the world so it's just, you're just a glutton for punishment clearly <laughs> <laughs> yeah I have a brother in law who's a triathlete and I think he's <laughs> glutton for physical punishment I think. I think too that there's something that makes you feel alive when you uh, are not so sure you can hit a note or when you can't pull it off or mm. you know what mm. I mean like I do you're just like it sucks because you're yeah. scared but 
it's also good to do things that scary because like if my, my dad uh, passed away now, it's like been 15 years. And mm. so he never saw any of this stuff, but I think it actually would have really helped him with his own stuff because mm. he was convinced that, you know, he couldn't get up in front of a room and speak and he couldn't yeah. do all these things. And he was, fr- he would, I think we shared a lot of that trait. Yeah. And then to see, if he would have seen me, get in front of it would be the last thing he thought i would have ended up doing yeah and he sees and it and then enjoying it talk to you that's all yeah like i would hope i would hope uh in some ways it would if he was still alive and to be able to talk to him about it it would have been like yeah. he would might consider taking things on that he, he just ruled out because yeah. i'm the last person that should be doing this yeah. um but yeah. it's like long enough and now i'm like oh, i kind of actually have started to really enjoy that aspect of it all i think i'll always enjoy the writing and that moment of oh my god look, listen to this mm-hmm. get goosebumps in the studio or writing on my little if you just use your voice memo there's this magic moment where no one's ever heard the song yet but you know it's it's moving it's and self-belief that, i think yeah it's, it's yeah. having self-belief because we i think a lot of people suffer self-doubt and the thing is you know i mean i suffer it i'll write something and think oh, okay and then i'll go to bed thinking it's absolute rubbish thinking i'm gonna to have to spend three hours the next day and i wake up and i read it and it's totally fine you know but it's you yeah, do yeah. It yourself. it's like self-sabotage yeah i think it's a way of uh also like yeah it, you're protecting yourself but you're also sabotaging any like growth with it uh exactly. but yeah every time we make an album i can proudly say there's no ideas left for that <laughs> moment you know it's like if there was we would have put them on the record so you realize that you're literally starting from scratch every yeah. time and i think again like i really admire comedians because we have it way easier than them in the sense that if we write a song like cleopatra we can play that as long as we want for till we stop touring and yeah. with a comedian they're expected to make a new hour of material every every tour every and every and they throw everything out but i think there is an aspect that's relatable which is uh unless you want to be like a legacy act where you're lucky enough to have songs people connect to but you're stopping new stuff yeah. <laughs> um you know watching neil young or watching bruce springsteen or bob dylan or tom petty i think all those examples tom petty was would always play his hits but he always wanted to play some new songs and you have that to varying degrees mm. with the artists i just mentioned where their tours are rooted around a new album. I remember hearing that about you too. It's like, yeah, they would much rather play a smaller place, excuse me, but be totally in what they're doing. And then they'll pepper in songs that you spent time with and you know better. But I think that's also a critical aspect to how they've been ar- around so much is because they're, they're curious. They're like children around their own new music. Mm-hmm. And, and they've maintained that just like, all these other artists that sort of stand the test of time and so finding that inner curiosity that sort of child when you think our producer simon felice he's done the last three records he's like mm. if you think you have it then you've had it like yeah you, yeah, you, yeah you know like you, you, you yeah. always have to be a little bit unsure because the minute it becomes like too easy in your head you're sort of uh you're relying mm. too much on your technique and your like it's and your not, legacy. That's not cool. And your legacy. Yeah. And you, did you say you you lose you lose the curiosity? And you've kind of answered my last question that I wanted to uh, just touch on. But obviously, reflecting on the journey to here, and obviously where it's taken you, and the things that you've been exposed to, um, and as I say, you you you've kind of answered answered it. But it's a case of, uh, you know, where are you tinkering now? Because you've just touched on it with regards to that kind of you could call it the Lumineer special sauce, you know, don't mess with the recipe, everything's working, you know, we've got this whole thing happening. Um, but a bit like, you know, taking on a cover that you, you know, otherwise wouldn't necessarily have done, you know, where is your curiosity kind of leading you next? Any idea? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, one of the things that I got exposed to over the years, but just the other day, uh, our, our, our tour manager, I'm sorry, our booking agent for part of the world. Um, his name's Alex. His dad was actually the drummer for Yes. Fun fact about Alex. But um, Alex Bruford, Bill Bruford's son. But he's, um, 
he exposed me to this band that he manages and they're called Fountains DC. DC, yes. Um, yeah, Fountains DC. And he told me they were they were poets that would used to meet up and then they turned it into this band. Sure. And it I listened to some of their music and then it kind of reminded me in some ways of like listening to the national when I first heard it in some mm. offshoot way in the sense that a lot of what they did was almost like a meditation. It would be like you say a phrase and then you say it again and you say yeah. it again. And and there's a mantra quality to that, or there's like something that wears you down in the best way mm. where or, or it breaks you down almost, you know, mm. um, that that recently is an example of like, oh, I've never really tried that. I've always treated lyrics as like on to the next line, on to the next line, yeah. turn the page. Cool and I was like, well, that would be interesting uh, to to try that that approach because or or the last record bright side we made completely kind of off the cuff like everything was done with a voice memo walking in the room and saying this is the real base of it this is a skeleton and then we mm. orchestrated and you know did everything to the song that you'd normally do for us before we got mm. to the studio we yeah, did it all yeah. there and i think the performances were way better because didn't know what we were doing spontaneity there there. Spont spontaneity right yeah. yeah yeah that's something i think we had to work through because when we were spontaneous at the beginning the ideas weren't very good you know and and so you had to you learn not to trust it but then i think over time you could say well the first time i do that might be the best you can consider that yeah. as an option whereas in the past we're like well that can't be good because that was the first but, but also yeah i mean you make the point that that you you didn't have the opportunity to overthink it uh which is yeah. i think part of why you know that's that's the curse don't do that thing and doing it the way that you did uh stop that from happening wesley i could talk to you all afternoon sir um <clears throat> an absolute uh pleasure um and just yeah, thank you sure. again for 2018 thank you for wednesday night um please keep doing what you're doing and uh yeah, um, all the very, very best with the rest of your travels and tour. Thank you. Yeah, tonight's our last night of the whole tour of this year. So uh, oh. but thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to the shows and for, for your kind words. It really does mean a lot. You know, coming to South Africa, we were here in 2013 and it was the it was literally the biggest show in the world we had played as our own. And it was the mm -hmm. last show of a four year basically tour we were on. And uh <laughs> So, so it's been amazing to come back and, and so thanks for coming and, and it just, it, it's been a pleasure coming out here and, and, you know, we'll be back every album, unless there's something like COVID that we're no one's touring. <laughs> that we'll be thing. touring. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah awesome. But Wesley, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, yeah, enjoy tonight and uh, safe travels home. Thank you, Jason. Take care. Cheerio. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, thanks for dealing with that Wi-Fi stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry no, you did well, stuff. sir. No, you did yeah. very well. Thank you for persisting. Right, we really cool. appreciate it. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Raj. Thanks, Sam. Thank Take, you, care. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.